American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com. So now I'm obsessed with time. Come on, tell me about the time. Had it all in my head tonight. Had the time of my life. When the words all come down, like blues on Tuesdays come down. Throw it all away. Throw it all away. All right. Welcome to another episode to of American, American Timelines. Episode. I'm Amy and that's Joe. Oh, American Timelines, what? I'm Amy and that's Joe. People listen for my singing. Nobody does. And um, we are... Idiots. Idiots. <laughs> and we are starting a new year. And we're not attractive. We are starting... To con- we're going to talk about 1959. That's right. For quite some time now. Yeah, we are going to finish up the 50s here, cruising along, and that'll be the end of season five of American Timelines. We will finally get to an end of a season. We've been That's doing right. it for a long ass time. Yes. Yeah, years. And then we're going to switch up things, and then we're just going to do history of porn stars. Yep. Yep. And, and all the sexual positions. And haunted done. attractions. And haunted. Uh, we're gonna dental we're equipment. gonna rate haunted attractions and haunted dental equipment and haunted furniture. Okay, all right, let's get right. started. Interview haunted furniture. Yeah, let's get started with nineteen fifty nine. Let's just jump in as we do when we jump in a new year. You guys have all heard me say this so many times. There's a bunch of things that don't quite have dates, but they were that year. You know, mm-hmm. not specific. So I'm just gonna talk about a couple things briefly, and we're only gonna cover January. Maybe the beginning of February, because there's so much. Okay? Got it. Uh, the top song of 1959 was Mac the Knife by Bobby Darren. You know how that goes? Yes, I do. When the, the, when the uh, shark bites at his and teeth, teeth and he shows them pearly whites. And the jack knife now, I wasn't born in anyway. 1959, but I don't think I made it, was made aware of that song until that whole McDonald's campaign about the guy with yes. the moon face. I remember. That's what I picture when Mac I hear that song. Yeah. Yep. And I love that It was guy. from the Three Penny oh. Opera, which I was in in college. Oh, really? Yeah. I played uh, Lucy. I think it was her name. Did you have any kiss scenes? Kissing scenes? No. I had a song. Any nudity in that one? Or? No. It Good. was old timey. Old timey. So. Yeah. No skimpy outfits? No, it was long dresses. How was your dancing? Oh, it was fabulous, probably. You think you're a triple threat? No, definitely not. Well, the big movies that year of 1959 included Ben-Hur, Sleeping Beauty, and Some Like It Hot. Hot, Great movie. One of your favorites. Yeah, I love love that one. Marilyn Monroe. Yes. Uh, Just to give you a uh, reference point in... um, prices of things you guys really know where we are the price you want to guess the price of alcoa aluminum wrap a 75 foot roll in 1959 like tinfoil <laughs> yeah a 75 foot roll of tinfoil in 1959 probably a nickel 69 cents that's high it's 75 feet it's a lot it's a big roll oh okay it is high i don't think i wonder how much it is now it's probably 379 now huh the world population was 2.9 billion. What is it now? Does that give you a reference? What would you think it is right now? It was like 30 billion or something. 7.8 billion. <laughs> You're way off. I'm way off. You're way off. No idea. After you get past a certain number, it's like, I have no Concept conception of it. Of yeah. Numbers. Right. But just think about it. 1959, there was 2.9 billion, and there's 7.8 billion now. Yeah. And it's. Now that That's abortion's illegal, it's going to explode. Yeah, we're going to keep making people. There's going to be a, a, another baby boom. Probably. The U.S. life expectancy uh, that year was 66.8 for males and 73.2 for females. Now it's 371 for males. What? That's a life expectancy, isn't it? No. In the order years? Uh, the Bic Crystal Ballpoint Pen was first sold in the U.S. in 1959 for 19 cents. Okay. And you know how much it costs today? 
No. 19 cents still. Probably. Pens. Bic crystal ballpoint pens never get any more expensive. Yeah, they're kind of like posted stamps. Risk, the continental game, now called Risk, the game of global domination, was introduced by Parker Brothers in 1959. Sweet. And just so you know, your favorite thing, the Kentucky Derby winner in 1959 was Tommy Lee. Tommy Lee? Yeah, the drummer for Motley Crue. Wow. Uh, well, it used to be a horse. <laughs> and the Westminster Kennel Best in Show dog was the Fontclair Festoon. Okay. Whatever the hell that is. Yeah. Uh, and then now I am insisting on from now on, all of our future dogs must be Fontclair Festoons. Okay. I don't know. I've never even heard of that in my life. I think that's a kind of a dog, or maybe that's the name of a dog. Font Clarifestune was the dog's name, maybe? I don't know. I guess I could quickly mm-hmm. Google it, but that would take time and effort, and I'd have to right-click and all that. Time Magazine's Man of the Year. Do you want to guess who that was for 1959? It was probably Jack Lemon. Close. Dwight D. Eisenhower. Oh. Okay, Font Clarifestune is a poodle. It's a type of poodle. Okay. So there you go. It's a, those like long haired ones that uppity British ladies always have. Like snooty. Yeah. Snooty late British women. Those big giant ones? Yeah, like the. With the balls of fur? No, the, like this one. Like it looks like that. Oh. It's smoking. That one's smoking a cigarette. Um, Miss America. Do you want to guess who Miss America was in 1959? No, I'm not going to know. Marianne Mobley. You want to guess what state she's from? Alabama. Mississippi. Oh, that's close. Brandon, Mississippi. Miss USA was from California. Terry Huntingdon. And one of the big quotes from 1959 is this. Stop me when you know it or yell it out when you know it. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call... The Twilight Zone. Yes, good job. Rod Serling. Yes. Did you ever watch the Twilight Zone? Oh, I loved it. Do you still love it? Yeah, they're good. Let's watch it right now. Let's just... Let's just watch it while we record yeah, ourselves. Yeah, let's just not... Let's stop recording and just watch an episode. All right. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was denied a request to visit Disneyland during a trip to the U.S. in 1959, and he became enraged and stated, But just now I was told that I could not go to Disneyland. I asked, Why not? What is it? Do you have rocket launching pads there? I do not know. Because that's a, that's a dead-on impression. Of a Russian of guy. Khrushchev. Yeah. yeah. That's what he sounded like. Uh, Volvo invented the modern seatbelt in 1959. They wanted to save lives, so they made Good. an open patent allowing other manufacturers to use the same design because they didn't want to make ri- become rich. They wanted to save people. That's nice. So props to Volvo. to Volvo. Uh, every car produced today uses the, this mechanism, considered one of the major safety inventions of the 20th century, saving over one million lives. Bravo. And some of the biggest TV shows, according to Nielsen, you, have this you ever year? seen those, vi- real quick, have you ever seen those real videos quick. of um, people back then when they start, they put the seatbelt laws in place and how people They're were like, these what is this rights. communist Russia? And yeah. like, it was the same with when they said you couldn't drink and drive. Drink any- and drive, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, need, I need to have a couple beers after work. What are you talking about? Yeah, there's one floating on TikTok right now where guys complain about seatbelts and drinking, drinking. In, in the car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, 1959-60 television season, the number one show was Gunsmoke. Yes, my grandma used to watch that. Wagon Train, followed by Have Gun, Will Travel. Uh, Gunsmoke was on for a long time. Yeah, all Must those, we- they're all Westerns. And I know, The yeah. Danny Thomas show, the Red Skeleton The 50s show. was obsessed with the Old West. Yeah, they really were. And the future, like Space Age stuff, you know. And Well, I'm glad you mentioned that future uh, Space Age stuff because uh, Futurama... Mm-hmm. Is was an exhibit at the 1939 World's Fair that showed what they thought the world would be like in 1959. Oh. And they th- because in 1939 they thought by 59 it would be like you know like highways would, highways would be automatic you know cars yeah. wouldn't 
there would be crash detection. They wouldn't be able to crash and stuff. Yeah. All kinds of things. And so here's the, I'm, you might hear this background music that I'm playing as part of the, the story. First wondering, then searching, then continuing to explore, men have moved on and on. Always to find that old horizons open the way to new horizons. There's a lot of predictions this year of what the future was going to hold, and boy, were they off. Uh, but this was 1939, saying 1959 would be unbelievable, futuristic, mm-hmm. and right. Uh, it really wasn't. But they did get to the moon. True. When the, I guess that was 60. If you believe nine. that, yeah. If you believe it. Of course, we believe it. That's right. Not everybody believes Not it. Not everybody does, though. Uh, the inch. I don't know if you know that this ever happened. I didn't know the inch was ever adjusted. The inch was adjusted by two millionths of an inch to make it equal to exactly 25.4 millimeters. They adjusted oh, the God. inch. They changed the Why size. Why don't they just make it, change the whole thing to the metric system? I know Reagan was big into that. He wanted to do that, and everybody got mad at him. We would be equal to everybody else. I mean, else. it's so stupid. It's like uh, the king's foot. Is what we use still. Is that what it is? Yes. That's what a foot is? is yes, king's the king's foot? foot. Oh, my gosh. I mean, and all of our stuff, yards and inches and all of that stuff goes back to, like, that kind of wacky stuff. Well, if we didn't, you wouldn't have that salt and pepper song, Shoot, where he says, 12 inches to a yard. Have you sound like a, and he says a bad thing there. What are you talking I about? I want to shoop, shoop, a doop. You know, All right. Yeah, anyway. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, COBOL mm-hmm. is a programming language in computers. It was first introduced in 1959. Okay. And, and it still processes 90% of the planet's financial transactions. Whoa. And 75% of all business data, apparently. 1959, oh. the Rat Pack first appeared oh. all together, including Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr. Yep. And who are the other two? You know? What you, ones did you say? I said Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr. Why'd you pick? Why'd you say the? Well, the other two I always forget. Tony Bennett. No, no, no. He wasn't one of them. Well, he should have been. Tony Curtis. No. Manitou. No. Wait a minute. Um, Johnny something. Nope. There's no Um, Johnnies. There's a Joey. Oh, Joey something. Yeah, Joey Bishop or something. Yep, Joey Bishop. Joey Bishop. And I don't know. It rhymes with Schmieder. Wofford. Peter Lawford? Yeah, Peter I Lawford. I never would have guessed that. Yeah, I was, you always forget those two. The Forgotten Rat Pack members. Mm-hmm. The late 50s and early 60s Rat Pack era appears to have begun in Las Vegas in January of 1959 when Sinatra and Dean Martin, then performing separately at the Sands Lounge and Casino, began appearing in each other's acts. And that will launch us into January. I guess sometime in January that happened. Uh, January 1st was a Thursday of 1959. And Cuban, pre- Cuban President Fulgencio Batista fled to the Dominican Republic as the forces of Fidel Castro closed in. Oh, man. Before leaving, Batista named Judge Carlos Manuel Piedra as provisional president, who ordered a ceasefire moments after taking office. Yeah. And at 10 p.m. that night, the ships USS Francis M. Robinson, USS Jack W. Wilkie, and the USS Peterson were directed to sail to Cuba to evacuate any Americans if necessary. Yeah. Because it was a regime change. Right. And then the next day was Friday, January 2nd. Luna 1, also known as Mikta, uh, which means dream, Mm -hmm. I guess, was the first lunar rover. It was the first spacecraft to reach the vicinity of Earth's moon and the first spacecraft to be placed in heliocentric orbit. Oh. Intended as an impactor, Luna 1 was launched as part of the Soviet Luna program in 1959, but a malfunction in the ground-based control system caused an error in the upper stage rocket's burn time, and the spacecraft missed the moon by 5,900 kilometers. Whoa. Which is like from here to like Tulsa. Oh. Uh, which is, was, oh no wait, it's not here to Tulsa. It missed it by 5,900 kilometers, which is more than three times the moon's radius. Okay. Uh, so that maybe led me down a rabbit hole. It's like, what? How big is the moon's radius? And that's like from here to Tulsa. Oh. So if you went around the moon, it's equal to driving to Tulsa from here. Okay. So now you know how big the moon is, right? Right. It's not that big. No. It's kind of small. 
It's like a thousand something miles around, a thousand seventy six or something like that. All right. Anyway, uh, so that thing they launched missed the moon. They were trying to hit the moon, and it ended up in orbit. It was the first thing, artificial planet in orbit that we know of. And on January 3rd, Alaska became the 49th state. Really? Yeah. Do you know what the Alaskan flag looks like? No. Is a bear on it or something? It's got a big dipper and a, and a, a North Star Oh. in your face. That was a Saturday. It became a state. And President Dwight D. Eisenhower proclaimed it as the 49th U.S. state at 12.02 p.m. in Washington. A new American flag with seven staggered rows, each with seven stars, was introduced, given that a 50th state might soon be admitted, the 49th state flag was not widely produced. Yes. And Eisenhower added, With limited exceptions, agencies of the federal government will continue to display the 48th star flag so long as it is still in good condition and until existing stocks of unused flags are exhausted. It is appropriate for all citizens to do the same. He so, was so thrifty always. Yeah, save money. Yeah, why, why throw everything out? Yep. Well, everybody could have made garments out of all the American flags. You're not supposed like, to back then. They, no, you're, you're they still they not allowed to, technically. It's, it's unpatriotic. But, but yeah. if they did, everybody would look like Apollo Creed. Yeah. January 4th was a Sunday. No, no. January 5th was a Monday. Sorry. And qualifications were established on that date for Project Mercury mm-hmm. for pilot selection. So Project Mercury was the next... American space flight uh, project to send a human in orbit. And they had a, they had to have a meeting at NASA headquarters to come up with the qualifications for humans, what human. So the human has to be less than 40. They have to be shorter than 5'11". They have to have excellent physical condition. They have to have a bachelor's degree or equivalent. Uh, they have to graduate from a test pilot school. They have to have 1,500 hours flight time. And they have to be a qualified jet pilot. Other than that, it can be anybody. Okay. Uh, and that same day, the New York Herald Tribune columnist Marie Tory went to jail for a 10-day sentence for contempt of court rather than reveal her source. Good for her. For a 1957 story about Judy Garland. Oh. Who was in a bitter uh, contract dispute with CBS. Ah. And so it was sort of a negative story about Judy Garland. Uh, that she had revealed some things, and uh, they demanded that she reveal her sources. They want to get to the bottom of it, but she refused. And she was in prison on the seventh floor, seventh floor of the Hudson County Jail in Jersey City. And she was released on her tenth day on January fourteenth without disclosing her information. And she later became an anchor person in Pittsburgh. Uh, and so she stood up for all journalists. You know, it's yeah. an important thing. To stand up for future journalism. And then January 7th was a Wednesday in 1959, and Cuba's new government announced the first executions of former officials of Fulgencio Batista. Ten officers officers were executed at Santiago, including Colonel Ar- Arcadio Casillas, who oversaw Santiago. The same day, the U.S. recognized the new Cuban government of Fidel Castro. They executed all the former leaders. Because that's what you should. That's what they should get back to. Yeah, just execute everybody. Just execute everybody that was in office before you. Maybe we not. should do that in our country. Maybe not. May I, let me rethink that. Yeah, I think you should. Um, at twelve thirty nine p.m. that day, the U.S. Congress gained three new members. Bob Bartlett and Ernest Gruning took the oath as senators, and Ralph J. Rivers became Alaska's lone U.S. representative. They only got one representative. But uh, so yeah, you got a new state. You got to have new. Representation, yeah, right? Right. That's why people want to make Puerto Rico and DC states. And get more get more representation for Democrats. And for people of color. Of maybe. color, yeah. Um January eighth, nineteen fifty nine, uh cheering crowds greeted Fidel Castro as he made a triumphant entry into Havana. And that's important to this Havanese dog right sitting next to us. He's that's a Havanese, right. so he's a bit and he's also a baby. He's a baby and he comes from Cuba. He's Cuban. He always chomping on Cuban cigars. Uh, and then January 10th, 1959 was a Saturday. The U.S. District Court in Atlanta ordered the University System of Georgia to admit qualified African Americans into its segregated colleges, striking down a requirement that at least two college alumni had to sign for a student to enroll. 
That's how they had to do it before. You had to have two. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Meanwhile, the federal court in Little Rock ordered the school board to integrate and reopen the Arkansas City High Schools, which had been closed for four months. Remember, they they closed them rather than yes. integrate before? Yep. Uh, and how about this one? This is one I thought you might be covering. January 10th, 1959, this Saturday, in Carmel, California, retired movie actress Claire Del Mar, who was like a 1920s silent film actress, was found stabbed to death Whoa. in her home. Ooh. Her real name was Claire Moore, mm-hmm. and she had appeared in silent films with Al Jolson and the Jazz Singer and with Rudolph Valentino and the Four Horsemen. Uh, her mutilated body uh, was found in the home she shared with her aged, bedridden mother in Carmel, California. Clara was 57 years old, and according to the investigating sheriff, the woman was struck over the head outside the house, then carried into the bedroom where she was sexually assaulted and butchered with a steak knife. Oh, God. Yes. I know you love You're the one who You're brings the, the rape this, this yeah. time around. Yeah, I bring it this time, and you have to listen to it. Scrapbooks and photographs on the wall identified more as a one-time silent screen actress, Claire Del Mar, who had appeared uncredited in those films that we mentioned before. She was uncredited? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I guess. I don't know why. Uh, sh- she had been married to Hollywood cameraman Hal Moore, M-O-H-R, in 1926. Uh, and Eric Von Stroheim was the best man. Uh, but that ended in divorce in 1929. As of 2014, this case remains open. Whoa. Of course, that was 2014. That's been a long time. Maybe it's somebody's reopened. But I couldn't find, couldn't find anything much more on recent. this at all. I, couldn't yeah. find, I struggled to find this much. Wow. So that might be a murder you should investigate. Well, if you couldn't find anything on it, then it's not. Well, I didn't take, you know, I, I went like two pages deep in Google. Oh. You know, you could probably try harder. Like go to a library or something, get some microfiche, some microfilm. I'm not doing that. What's the difference between microfilm and microfiche now that we're talking about it? One has fins, duh. Oh, okay. January 11th, 1959 was a Sunday. Yes. And on this day, a nine-day-old baby girl. Mm-hmm who had been kidnapped from a hospital three hours after her birth, was found safe Oh! at a Brooklyn apartment. Mrs. Jean Lavarone was arrested for charges of having stolen Lisa Chinocchio, Chino, Chinocchio, probably, looks like Pinocchio, but with a C-H mm-hmm. in the front, from St. Peter's Hospital in New York on January 2nd, prompting a citywide hunt. Wow. According to kidnapping102.rsessing.com, which is a website, <laughs> uh, Robert A. Waters wrote that uh, right after she was born, her parents, Francis, a teacher, and Frank, a lawyer, cuddled their newborn, then allowed hospital staff to take her to the nursery. Two and a half hours later, she vanished. After a long and fruitless nine-day search, a crucial anonymous phone call that sent police cars to a tenement near the hospital eventually paid off. Upon breaking into the one-room apartment, officers found 43-year-old Jean Lavarone cradling an infant. Initially, she denied any involvement in the abduction, but her fingerprints, blood tests, and a unique birthmark all confirmed the identity of the child as Lisa Rose. As the case had gripped the city of New York, the news of the girl's safe return was welcomed with jubilation. Afterwards, Lisa Rose was examined at St. Peter's Hospital and reunited with her relieved parents who were delighted to discover she was in good health, having been well taken care of. And they didn't even press charges. They didn't? The poor... Oh, my God. Yeah, they felt bad for the woman who had, who had stolen the baby because she had a troubled past. Uh, everyone in her life had died or been forcibly taken from her. All of her eight living children had been placed in orphans' homes or foster care. Jeez. She'd been married twice. Her first husband divorced her. Her second husband died. And according to the Associated Press... Uh, she wanted this baby to pressure her boyfriend, Joseph Pizzamenti, Pizzamenti, into marriage by having him believe he was the father. Oh, my God. She also believed the courts would return four of her children if she was married to a reputable husband. All of her children were removed because she was considered incapable of caring for him. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's sad. But they didn't want to press charges. They felt bad for her. Okay. Uh on January 12th, 1959, that was a Monday, and in Spain, five boys who wanted to go hunting for bats discovered the caves of Nerja. Ooh. The caves blocked by stalactites had been sealed for more than 3,000 years, and there was a trove of paleo, 
lithic artifacts. Wow. All dildos. Yeah. Uh, and then on January 17th, 1939, that was a Saturday. In San Francisco, the North American Rugby Football League was unveiled in a press conference with Ward Nash as commissioner of the first pro rugby league in the U.S. Former 49er Gordy Saltow was introduced as owner of the San Francisco franchise in a projected six-team league with Los Angeles, Vancouver, Seattle, Houston, and Dallas. The season was to start in 1960 and run until late May and expressed plans to use retired and off-season players from the Rams and the 49ers. The Narfel, however, never materialized. So that was a waste of time for me to read that and for yes. that to have happened. Yes. And we got our first birthday. Agreed. January 17th, 1950. Now we got a birthday. Hit it, Matt Truman Ego Trip, where you can purchase his music on Bandcamp. Amy, Amy hates birthdays. American singer for the Bengals in Los Angeles, Susanna Hoffs, mm. was born. And she was super hot, and I had a big crush I on know her. I you did. She was born to a Jewish family. Her grandfather was a rabbi. And I did not know this. She was the daughter of film director, writer, producer, Tamar Ruth. Uh, she had made a bunch of movies. And Joshua Allen Hoffs was her father, who was a psychoanalyst. Her, All right, you're blathering. And her mother played Beatles music for her when she was a child. Anyway, she went to Palisades High School, same school as Forrest Whitaker, home of the Dolphins. Forrest Whitaker, and I mentioned this, I mentioned Forrest Whitaker went to school with Susanna Hoffs on the Nerd School podcast a couple weeks ago. All so right, we're moving cross on. Cross promotion, Nerd School, and American Timelines, always talking about Palisades High School with Forrest Whitaker and Susanna Hoffs, the hottest Bengal chick. January 19, 1959. And you know what? Art star. He didn't know who Susanna Hoffs was. All right, move on. Whoa. You don't care about Arthur Lovely? Man, shots fired. Uh, January 19th, 1959 was a Monday. And Sergeant General, Sergeant Richard G. Corden, who had been captured as a prisoner of war in the Korean War, and then chose to live in communist China rather than return to the U.S., Finally returned to the U.S. after an eight-year absence. Mm. So there was a lot of these guys that were kind of, they say, brainwashed yeah. by Chinese officials because they were prisoners of war for a long time. And just like they were just given propaganda over and over and over about how awful the U.S. was and right. how great so socialism was. And so mm -hmm. a lot of them didn't want to come back. But he finally came back. And uh, when he came back, he arrived in San Francisco and he had an impromptu news conference with reporters, and he said he was returning to the U.S. because he just got homesick, he said. He denied being a communist, but stated he was impressed with socialism. Mm. So, And a lot of these guys just come back and they're just a shell of their former selves. Right. It's really sad. Yeah. Um, and on January 21st, 1959, which is a Wednesday, we have two deaths. Do you know who Cecil B. DeMille is? Yes. American movie producer. He was 78 years old. He died at his home after a short illness. Okay. Uh, and I don't know if you know this, but the same day Cecil B. DeMille died, Carl Switzer, who played Alfalfa from The Little Rascals, who was only 31 years old, mm -hmm. also died. Oh, poor guy. But did you know he was murdered? Oh, he was? Yes. Alfalfa was shot and killed in North Hollywood during a fight Ooh. with Bud Stilts. Oh, man. Whom Switzer confronted over a claimed debt. You see... It all stemmed from uh, Carl Alfalfa Switzer uh, was watching a dog for uh, Bud. Okay. Switzer agreed to train a hunting dog, I guess. A, uh, yeah. a treeing walker coonhound for Moses Samuel Bud Stilts, who was a longtime friend and sometime business partner of Switzer. Uh, who They met while working with Roy Rogers on various productions. Um, and, uh, while he was under the care of Switzer, the dog ran off and he lost him. Oh. Uh, so, uh, still said, uh, Alfalfa must either return his dog or pay him the equivalent of the dog's value. Unable to produce the cash because back then they treated movie stars yep. terribly. They have nothing. They're all... They were all, like, totally broke, but so, they were old. Yeah, so Switzer took out ads in the newspapers and put up flyers offering rewards for the safe return of the animal. Eventually, they got the dog back, but they had to give the person who rescued the dog and found it a reward 
They gave him $35 cash and $15 in alcoholic beverages from the bar Alfalfo had to work in. Alfalfo was working in a bar. That's mm-hmm. the equivalent of about 450 bucks uh, mm. in today's money. Okay. So that loss did not sit well with Switzer. Alfalfa couldn't afford that much. So he was pissed about that. He's like, I got to pay all this to get his dog back? He needs to pay this back. Yeah. And still didn't agree because he's not the one who lost the dog. So that was a big argument. And uh, so uh, Alfalfa got pissed. Carl Switzer and his friend Jack Pyatt, a 37 year old photographer, showed up to Stilts' house where Stilts lived with his wife and his stepchildren. And they threatened him. They wanted his money back. And uh, he, they hit him over the head with a clock. Man. Then he ran and got a gun mm-hmm. from his room. And there was a struggle for the gun. The gun went off and almost struck one of the kids. Oh. Uh, and then Stilt said, as he was in self-defense from Alfalfa, Alfalfa pulled out a knife, was about to stab him, and he shot him in self-defense, right in the balls. He shot him in the nuts. He did? Yeah, he got shot in the nuts, and oh, he bled no. out. Whoa. Yeah, Alfalfa got shot in the nuts. That's how he died. Uh, but an artery later, down there, I believe. Later, yeah, a major artery. Just, yeah. Uh, but I guess later on, the stepson said that it wasn't self-defense, and the struggle was over, and Alfalfa agreed to leave. And as they were walking out, he shot him in the nuts, and then he died. Poor and guy. Th- then he threatened his buddy uh, that uh, should not say anything. And so, so they never. This guy never got convicted. They said it was self-defense. And oh, really? Yeah, they didn't. They never called the stepson to testify. So shoddy yeah. workmanship. So that's a tragic end for Alfalfa. So next time you watch Little Rascals, then just know. Just keep in mind that he got shot in the balls. Man. Yeah. That uh, so some of the uh ref- the some of the sources were LA Mirror, tvparty.com and a book by Burt Kearns called The Murder of Alfalfa. Wow. I didn't know Alfalfa was murdered. And then on January 22nd that Thursday, 12 coal miners died when Water breached the River Slope Mine in Port Griffith, Pennsylvania. And that brings us to January 23rd, 1959, a Friday, where my lovely wife, Amy, is going to take over and tell you all about presumably what? something awful. Oh, you got a good one, right? You got yeah. a mysterious one. Yes. Yes. I'm going to tell about the Dil- the Dil- Let me do it again. Hello. I'm going to tell about the Diatlov Pass incident. The Diat Love Pass into the... Yes. Now, I feel like we've covered this before. No, I've, I've mentioned it before. You mentioned it? Because I Googled yeah. this for some other reason yeah, before I mentioned past. it. I never covered it, but mentioned it. Okay. So this was um, a group of real experienced hikers. They were in their 20s. Oh, my two main sources, Ranker.com article by Patrick Thornton and okay. InterestingEngineering.com article by Marsha Wendorf. Thank you, Marsha Wendorf and Patrick Thornton, for your contribution to American Timeline All right. History Shush. of the Jerks. So these experienced hi- hikers were going to go on a skiing expedition up in the Urals. What? Up in the what? The Urals. What are those? Ural Mountains. Oh. In <laughs> Russia. Oh. That's what they call them? The yeah. Urals? I've yes. never heard that before. So uh, the they leader did. of the group was 23-year-old... Igor Dyatlov. Igor Dyatlov is a solid choice for your leader. He was also studying radio engineering at the Ural Polytechnical Institute. Okay. The other group members were current or recent students at the institute, except 37-year-old Semyon Zol... Oh, these names. Yeah, Russian. Zolotaryov, who joined the expedition shortly before the group's departure on January 23rd, 1959. Okay. So there was... Here's the names, and I do have to say them. Okay. So in, di- in addition to Dyatlov and Zolotaryov, the expedition group consisted of Yuri Doroshenko, who was 21, okay. Ludmila Dubinya, 20, okay. Okay. Georgi Krivonshenko, 23, yep. Alexander Kolevitov, 24, uh-huh. Zineda Kolimgorova, 22, and Rustem Slobodin, 23, Nikolai Thibodeau Brynos, 23, and Whoa. Yuri Yudin, 21. Wow. So after traveling for about five days, Yudin left the expedition because he wasn't feeling good. Okay. So the rest of them kept going. So they were last seen alive in the remote village of Vizai, where they spent one night before leaving on January 27th. Okay. Dyatlov had stated he would make contact with his college's sports club once they returned to Vizai. 
Okay. So they're they were hiking up a mountain, right? Yeah. And they were expected Cold. to report back by February 12th. Yeah. But Yudin later confirmed that as he left the group, Dyatlov believed they would be gone past that due date to, due to weather conditions. Yeah, but it was Because nuts. February was considered one of the most dangerous times to attempt this kind of trek. So why would they? Why would I don't you? know why anybody yeah. does these things. I don't get it anywhere. If anywhere, great ever. weather, why would you do it? By February 20th, more than three weeks since the group had departed Visay, family members were begging police to start a search and rescue mission um how about now if i was a police officer i'd be like fuck don't do this shit i don't want to go rescue you ass i know searchers didn't locate the campsite for nearly a week and the months passed before they located all nine members okay. of the expedition so how many months on february 26 yeah, okay. 1959 the rescuers from the ural polytechnical institute found the diatlov group's tent that's the oh. first thing they found okay it was cut in half but from the inside. Whoa, what? Within the tent were all the group's belongings, including their shoes. Huh. Outside the tent, there were nine sets of footprints made by people who were wearing only socks, a single shoe, or were barefoot. This is huh. in snow. So they so they had to, they left in haste. Right. The rescuers followed the footprints, some of which led down toward the edge of nearby woods, okay. which is about almost a mile. Okay. Northeast of the tent. At the edge of the forest, under a large pine tree, the rescuers found the remains of a small fire and the shoeless bodies of Krivonshenko and Doroshenko, who were wearing only their underwear. Oh. Then, above the bodies, the branches on the pine tree were broken to a height of about 16 feet, indicating at least one of the men had climbed up to look at, look at something, like try to find camp or something, maybe. Huh. In their underwear? I know. That's the weird thing. And then fallen down, like they f fell from the tree? Is what it looks like? Or they climbed down. I don't yeah. know, but they broke the branches. Oh, you could tell the branches were broken. So but, might yeah. Know. Between the pine tree and the camp, the rescuers found three more bodies, those of Dyatlov, Kolomegorova, and Slobodin. They were lying several hundred meters from one another. Okay. In addition to being frozen, the bodies showed bruising and burns. Huh. Investigators later determined that Slobodin had also suffered a skull fracture. Then it wasn't until May 4th that where they found Ludmilla... Uh, Dubinia, Alexander Kolevatov, Nikolai Thibodeau Brigno, and Semyon Zolotarov, uncovered <laughs> from 13 feet of snow in a nearby ravine. The three had apparently attempted to create a shelter for themselves. They all had very extensive injuries. Ludmilla and Semyon both had crushed chests, and their eyes were missing, Whoa. as well as Ludmilla's tongue. What? Nikolai's skull had been crushed, and Alexander's neck was broken. Whoa. Burns were also found on their bodies and clothing. Burns? At first, investigators were at a loss. Well, there was a fire. There was remnants of a fire earlier, right? Yeah. So, okay. So, at first, investigators were at a loss as to what happened to the group. However, multiple members of the group had kept journals and taken photographs to record what ended up being their final days. They apparently set up camp on January 31st before making their first big climb. Then on February 1st, they made their way through what would later become known as the Dyatlov Pass. Okay. The poor weather conditions caused the expedition to lose its, its course and head west, so they get lost. So this pass didn't even have a name. They no. named it after this guy. That's right. At that point, they set up camp at the bottom of Kolat Sakai, although a safer area was only a mile away. This was a big mountain yeah, called that. They probably didn't know that. Experts theorized the group chose not to backtrack towards safer areas so as not to lose any more time. Uh. So when they found the first five bodies, investigators assumed the entire group had died from hypothermia. However, that theory would fall apart when they found the real injured bodies of those others. Yeah. Um, scientists later theorized, some, some scientists later theorized, the reason that they were barefoot and in their pajamas was due to something called paradoxical undressing that is something that's brought on by hypothermia. Really? Like you, because hypothermia yeah. can cause burning sensations yeah, leading so to people like to hot. remove their clothing and attempt to cool themselves. Oh, my gosh. And, but the ones, again, the people in the ravine that were so injured, that doesn't explain what happened yeah. to them. They all had tried to put on additional clothing. So some people tried to blame the local indigenous people for their deaths. That uh -huh. was the first big of theory. Yes, the it was a tribe. Because everything's by the, racist in the fifties. Yeah, this tribe was known as the Monsi. They were the land's indigenous people, and I think it's uh, some Sasquatch. people said it was them. Some people said severe winds may explain. So 
uh, researchers developed two theories in which wind may have contributed to the group's death. The first theory is something called a catabatic wind. And it in that theory, that kind of wind swept through the area, causing gusts of wind severe enough to kill a human. Really? This was the case in a 1978 hiking expedition in Sweden where all but one member of an expedition was killed by catabatic wind. You mean the wind, like, knocks them into the mountain or something? It's so, so bad, strong it's... that it kills you. Like it just hurts your body? To I guess it just you. blasts your bones into dust. Wow. The skiing party at Dyatlov Pass may have fled the winds by heading toward the forest to seek shelter, resulting mm. in the four members being found in the ravine. Okay. The second theory is that the wind whipping around the mountain caused infrasound that was so jarring that it gave the skiers panic attacks. Whoa. And the group possibly left the tent in a panic and eventually recovered from the sound, but when were then unable to find their way back to the campsite in the dark. But that wouldn't... Explain the bruising. That's and right. The crushed skulls and all that. Really and then some people thought there was another theory that they were it was military testing or the KGB. Ooh, yeah, could be. Um, because they had one of the th- weird things was it looked like they'd been exposed to radiation. Really? The bodies, and that led to speculation about military involvement. Wow! Because the Soviet Union was testing parachute mines in the area where the deaths occurred, and those oh. mines exploded in the air and may have accounted for photos the group took of balls of light in the sky. Oh. The impact of the mines exploding midair is believed to have been enough to kill the skiers without causing extensive external damage to the bodies. There you go. This also would have accounted for burns found on the group's clothing and skin. But they said they found pictures of light. The people, Things? they had taken pictures of lights yeah, in the sky. Some have even gone so far as to say the Soviet military murdered the expedition group and that the 37-year-old Zolotaryov was part of the KGB, though that has never been confirmed. Yeah, okay, and then there's the there. Yeti UFO theories. Mm-hmm. So somebody, uh, there was, like I said, there was a... There was another photo and that resulted in a theory that it was a Russian Yeti. Um, it was taken with Nikolai yeah. Thibodeau Brignot's camera depicting a large shadowy figure approaching the campsite. Really? However, this figure is believed to be one of the skiers, and the whole Yeti theory may have been a result of a satirical pamphlet someone in the group had brought with them about Yeti sightings. Hmm. In addition, the photos of bright orbs in the sky taken on Krivoshenko's camera led to the claim oh. that the deaths and radiation exposure were the results of a UFO. Oh, UFO could be the shit out of But that's yeah. kind of been debunked since the bright lights on the film may have simply been an issue with the film itself. Hmm. Um, then they did an investigation in 2019 and determined that an avalanche killed the hikers. That's what it, it, it's not conclusive, but this was just the study that determined this. Okay, the Russian government in 2019 reopened its investigation. Okay. Um, after years of pressure from all the family members and everything. According to this theory, a snow slab would have made a loud cracking noise and caused strong vibrations, prompting the group to flee their campsite. Okay. The expedition team had been trained on what to do in the event of an avalanche, including making a snow cave like the one found in the ravine. A 2021 study further corroborated this theory. Despite the case being seemingly closed by this investigation, skeptics continue to point out that avalanches in the area are not and never have been common. The footprints leading away from the campsite also indicate the group walked rather than ran from the area. Huh. Opposing an avalanche explanation are the facts that the area showed no signs of an avalanche having taken place. Yeah, so you would there be all kinds of signs, wouldn't there be? Well, and the fact that the bodies that were found within 10 days of the incident were covered with only a very shallow layer of snow. Mm-hmm. Since the incident, over 100 expeditions to the same area have taken place and none have ever reported an avalanche. Yeah. Because a snow slab avalanche occurs when a weak layer of snow lies beneath a snow pack. When that weak layer breaks off, it pulls all the layers on top of it down the slope. Okay. So, um, (laughs) that's what that is. But that is not proven, and so nobody really knows because... I would never want to be buried in an avalanche. No. No, it's not the way I want to go. Nope. But that was pretty interesting. That's I My first gut instinct was Sasquatch. His Sasquatch. Just because, you know, probably ripped him apart, but wouldn't he eat more than that? But the tongue missing... And the, ra- and the eyeballs missing. Yeah, the radiation. I guess that could be the tongue missing eyeball could just be after they died, maybe like birds or something. Yeah, owls it could be. I don't know what does that, but yeah. But what's an odd piece to be missing? Yeah. So that would mean Sasquatch wouldn't do that. That would be an alien. I don't know, but anyway. Anyway, that's exciting. That's it. It's crazy. Weird things happen, man. Weird things Weird. happen. Uh, my my YouTube algorithms are all about UFOs now. I don't know. I 
I got on those history oh, channel, boy. like uh, ancient alien yes. shows, you know, yes. and then when I'm going to sleep and then when I wake up with some crazy alien stuff and now I'm getting all these polls, like, would you like to meet an alien? You know, like, like I think YouTube thinks I'm obsessed with aliens. I'm really not. I'm just asleep. Yeah. Uh, but I am kind of obsessed with it. But all right. I think it's time to get out of here, Chuck Berry. No, I got a couple more things. Oh. That was January 23rd. That's the same day that uh, the U.S. Postmaster General Arthur E. Summerfield announced a serious proposal for the mail to be delivered by guided missile. Oh, my God. Summerfield, who in 1955 had successfully changed corner mailboxes from olive drab to red, white, and blue, added that if Congress provides us with sufficient funds, you may be assured that mail-carrying rocket missiles will be painted with traditional colors, red, white, and blue, of which every American is justly proud. So they're going to rocket the mail across the country. It's crazy. This might have been quicker. And then uh, January 24th, Walter Stoley of Germany began what would become the longest bicycle tour on record over nearly 18 years a bicycle tour. He rode his bike for 18 years, ending on December 12th, 1976. He rode more than 402,000 miles. Can you imagine how no. bad his taint would be Oh, my God, mangled? yeah. You can't ride a bike. I can't ride a bike for a mile without no my way. taint being on fire. Imagine how big I must not even have a taint. Yeah. January 25th. A big 19th, callus. A big callus taint. His taint was probably bigger than his head. Uh, on January 25th, the first American passenger jet service began. As an American Airlines Boeing 707 flew from L.A. to New York City. Uh, and I guess, so that was the fastest. Now that they have jets, like uh, mm-hmm. not just airplanes. So it was four hours and three minutes. Uh, it went. And then uh, January. Yeah, nobody cares about that. Nobody cares. Oh, no, that this is interesting. I didn't know this. January 28, 1959 was a Wednesday. American scientists at NASA announced that data from the Vanguard 1 satellite had shown that the Earth is not completely round. It's actually pear-shaped. Mm. The announcement was made at a press conference at the American Physical Society by Dr. J.A. O'Keefe. Uh, I had no idea that that was the case. Did you? I Mm-mm. thought it was round. So I feel like I've been had... And been that, hoodwinked. And that same day in Durango. Bamboozled. In Durango, Me- I was bamboozled. In Durango, Mexico, actress Audrey Hepburn was severely injured, breaking four vertebrae in her back. Ouch. And she was thrown from a horse while filming a Western. Ouch. According to news reports, uh, camera trouble developed and someone yelled, cut, and the horse stopped abruptly and she went over the horse's head. She recovered, and The Unforgiven would be released in 1960. The Unforgiven, so you have to watch that. Yep. If she had any signs. So horses know when you say cut, I guess. They know to stop. I guess. And then January 29th, Walt Disney's animated film Sleeping Beauty came out. Mm-hmm. And then on January 30th, 1959, the greatest American R&B singer ever was born in Chicago. Amy, Amy hates birthday, Jody Watley. Okay. Did you know that she was no. born in 1959? I don't care. She went to Susan Miller Dorsey Stop. High School. Home of the Dons and Donnas. Sparky Anderson and Keyshawn Johnson are notable alumni. And that's going to end yes. our episode of American Timelines by History for Jerks. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. Time to get out of here, Chuck Berry. Time to get out of here, Chuck Berry. And we love all of you. Except you, Carl Rabinowitz. You are no longer allowed to listen. Stop listening, Carl. Sick of you. Bad listener. Bad listener. Band of all time. Buy their music.